I wanted this time too to be a time of sharing with, of my heart uh, with you and a time when we could sort of sit quietly and hear God's word. And I wanted to come to this time too without the benefit of a pre-prepared manuscript or notes. And not that there's anything wrong with that and I use that all the time because I need it to refresh my memory. But there's sometimes things that can happen when we simply spontaneously look at the word that the Holy Spirit may impart on a specific occasion something that he once said that I could not have pre-anticipated in a, in a teaching preparation. And I have the luxury and advantage of having in my own personal life gone through the book of Acts many times and in fact written a textbook on it. So if I don't have the information together by now on Acts, I'm in trouble. And I'd like to go on the basis of having a backlog of information and let the Holy Spirit perhaps draw it to bear on our own uh, lives at this present moment. You know, there's a pattern also for speaking from a sitting position, and I once saw it very clearly when I was trying to memorize the Beatitudes. I was doing this sermon on some of the action and words of, of the Lord, and I was attempting to really get down the Beatitudes, and I was pacing back and forth and shouting at the top of my uh, lungs like I thought Jesus would have done uh, to crowds. When after I had memorized the Beatitudes and was going through this very rigorous oratorical demonstration of the Beatitudes, I suddenly stumbled across the first phrase that begins uh, the Beatitudes where it says, and when he was sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, and sitting down was a position the rabbis often assumed when they got ready to give uh, what might be called grave teaching or serious utterance. And it involves uh, not the demonstration of oratorical flourishes and crescendos of sound, but it involves uh, reason kind of thinking and gentle persuasion. And this is some of what I have in mind as we approach the book of Acts tonight. We're going to go as far as we feel that it's appropriate to go, and maybe we'll cover the first chapter of the book of Acts, which is a section from Resurrection to Pentecost. We want to note some things, however, about Acts as we begin, and that is its placement, first of all, in the canon of Scripture. It is in a very strategic spot, and have you ever considered what it would be like to not have the book of Acts at all in the New Testament? It would be very confusing, to say the least, to be able to uh, conclude the Gospel of John, which talks about Jesus asking Peter if he loves him, and we're done with John and done with the Gospels, and then all of a sudden we open, and the next page is Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, to the church at Rome. If we had nothing between John and the letter to the Romans, we might legitimately ask, what, who is this person called Paul? And how did the Gospel get to Rome? And not only how did it get to Rome, but who are these people who are non-Jewish? For the book of Acts chronicles the 30 years from the ascension of Jesus until about 63 AD with the imprisonment of the Apostle Paul in Rome. And the whole movement of the book of Acts gives us an understanding of what happened in the growth of the church in that time, how we have a ministry of a person like Paul, and how the church not only expanded geographically, that is, got from Jerusalem far away to Rome, but also how it expanded culturally, moving from an all-Jewish base to a large Gentile base. And without this important historical work, the fifth book of the Bible, the book of Acts, we would be in the dark about these things. The book of Acts, therefore, covers a span of approximately 30 years of time, and it's exciting to look at what might be down the road with us historically in the next 30 years. Could the next three decades, if Jesus tarried, be the most significant years of expansion of the Church of Jesus Christ so that they also would require a chronicle of the stature of Acts? Who of us can imagine what might be happening in the year 2017 when I am 76 years of age and you can guess whatever age you are if you're still alive 30 years from now? Who in the early church, in that birthday of the church on the day of Pentecost could have envisioned what the next 30 years would hold for the church? But it held, as we will see in going through it, powerful time of expansion. 
who is the author of this book? You will never find him named, of course. And as you read through the Gospels, you will never find any of the Gospel authors named. It uh, is striking that Matthew does not name himself, Mark does not name himself, Luke does not name himself, and John does not name himself when they write their Gospels. Nor does Luke again name himself when he writes his second volume. And I think that is so significant because if I were writing a gospel or a history of the early church, and remember that this book of Acts was the only history of the church written for three centuries. The next history after it was one written by Eusebius, third, third century A.D. If I were writing a book of such powerful persuasion, I would want my name probably attached to it, if for nothing else, the royalties, and then secondly, the recognition. Why are the gospel writers then silent? Why is Luke silent about giving his name? I think that there probably are two reasons, and they are important for instructing us on some matters in the church world today. One reason is that the story which they tell is not their personal story. It is not their biography. It is not their property, therefore. It is a story that belongs to the whole church of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is not fitting that they superimpose their name or their degree, or their talent over what belongs to the Lord and to his people. So fittingly, they, do, they represent it not as their singular story, but as that which belongs to all God's people. And then I think another reason why they do not name themselves is that there is that infusion of humility which the Lord had inbred into them, that uh, there was to be an honoring of the Lord God and a receding of the, uh, of the claim of the human personality for recognition and the like. And so they quite quietly fade into the background that they might tell his story, which is the right hyphenation of history, isn't it? History should be, from the Christian perspective, his story, God's story of activity in our lives and on the planet Earth. We look at the placement of this book in the canon, the authorship behind it, uh, the dating of the book, just uh, briefly, if we relied on internal evidence, we'd be brought to a conclusion that it was written shortly after the events of uh, described in chapter 28 come to an end. Why would the book of Acts end with an imprisonment if that wasn't all the history that had happened up to that time? If, if, if Luke had been writing in 70 or 80 or 90 A.D., it would be very strange that he would end his history with an imprisonment that was about 63 A.D. unless he intended to write a third volume. So it's probable that he writes somewhat contemporaneously to the events that end the book. And then one other thing, and by the way, that's an important point to note because one of the debates in biblical scholarship has to do with the dating of the Gospels in the book of Acts. And those who tend to operate from a liberal persuasion always select late dates because they want a late date like 70, 80, or 90 to say that what we have in the New Testament is the gathering of myth and it took time for the church to collect its stories and all the biblical writers were really were editors. They were not real writers. And furthermore, uh, Luke, for example, like the other gospel writers, gives us an account of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. If Luke wrote Luke Acts prior to 70 A.D., then what is written about the Olivet Discourse on the Lord's lips was really prophecy. But if Luke Acts and the other gospels were written after 70 A.D., then their statements about the destruction of Jerusalem in the words of Jesus may be subject to a claim that they put words in Jesus' mouth. So it is uh, always interesting to look at the internal evidence itself for what the books are saying about the time of their authorship. And implicitly, seemingly in this book, it would lead to a conclusion that was written somewhat contemporaneously with the events that the book ends with. One other thing by way of introduction should be noted, and that is the title of the book. We call it The Acts of the Apostles. And th that, of course, does not occur in the original text. That is the book title given by an editor, an early editor of this to sort of differentiate it from all other books. And that's a good title, The Acts. Now, there are some people in the body of Christ, some evangelicals, who suggest that to us that we cannot derive any doctrinal position if it is formulated in the book of Acts. 
because doctrinal positions can only be formulated from clear expository or didactic teaching such as we find in discourses in the Gospels or in letters, doctrinal letters that we see in the epistles. That you cannot make doctrine out of experience that is recorded in Acts. And I want to focus therefore on that word Acts for just a moment in that we learn Christian truth by not only hearing it taught, we learn Christian truth by seeing it demonstrated. And truth is just as valid in its demonstration or its modeling as it is when it is being taught point A, point B, point C, and point D. I have learned more truth about the Christian life personally, and I think you may have too, by watching other people live the Christian life than maybe I have learned it through simply reading a treatise on the Christian life. I learn more, for example, about humility by watching humble people than by reading my latest book on humility. And so don't let anyone say to you, well, the book of Acts is an interesting book, but it doesn't lead us to any doctrinal formulations. As we get into this book, we will see that the acts of God in human history and in the church in themselves become patterns from which we derive doctrinal perspectives and understandings of experiences that are valid and necessary for the believer today. The acts of the apostles, that's a misnomer because there aren't many apostles that acts really deals with. We're not told anything about what Thomas did, about what Matthew did. We're only told one or two things John did. And who is, uh, what did Judas, the son of James, do? Or uh, Bartholomew or Andrew? You see, their stories are not told in the book of Acts. So in reality, it isn't the Acts of the Apostles. The Apostles that are dealt with are Peter in the first 12 chapters and Paul in the last 16 chapters and there's an interfacing of those two apostles in chapter 15. It really focuses on two of the apostles and in a certain respect as someone has suggested it really isn't the acts of the apostles anyway. The whole book is the acts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, maybe that title should be where the stress belongs in that that same Holy Spirit is alive in the church today even though the apostles are gone from us the Holy Spirit is at work. Let's look now at some of the verses as we open to verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus. That, of course, is Luke's reference back to volume 1, to the Gospel of Luke itself, which had been dedicated to this person named Theophilus. Uh, you can say that so quickly that you might slur it and get the awfulest out of that. But it is Theophilus, Theo, the Greek word for God, and uh Phyllis coming from phileo, friend of God or lover of God. And some have postulated that uh, this was Luke's patron, the one who was the benefactor that provided the financial support necessary for the author to have the two years of research time that he needed in order to write his manuscript. Well, that's sheer conjecture. No one knows that for sure. Others have suggested that Theophilus is a person who is very interested in the Christian faith. He has a Greek name suggesting that therefore he is non-Jewish and Luke is writing to persuade him and inform him accurately of all these things. Others suggested that Theophilus simply is a representative man for all who will be a friend of God this this book is addressed to. And when you look at uh, the fact that both Luke and Acts are addressed to the same person, you realize that what you've got here is one book in two volumes. And therefore, Luke himself, by sheer weight of words, becomes the most, uh, uh, the one who writes more New Testament scripture than any other writer. Word for word, Luke outproduces Paul. If you take all the pages of Paul or all the words of Paul and add them together and stack them against all the words of Luke, then Luke writes more scripture than does anyone else in the New Testament. And uh, Luke is not writing uh, by what we might call dictation inspiration. That is, he's not sitting at his desk and, uh, and saying, okay, Lord, uh, what, what, what was next? What, what was the next? I, sorry, Lord, would you repeat the last sentence? I didn't get it. He says in the first volume, in the first four verses, that his method of writing was to consult written sources and to interview eyewitnesses, himself not being an eyewitness, and that on the basis of research, he had inquired 
as to the accuracy of what was reported to him so that he might set it down in an orderly way. So what the Lord is saying about inspiration through the writing of Luke is that the process of the making of Scripture is not some hocus-pocus kind of a thing where there is a voice that materializes in a room and begins mechanically dictating to a writer, but that the Lord in breathing the Scripture into being works through the unique individuality and uh, human aspects of the writer and what the Holy Spirit does in promoting or causing that person to write is to guarantee the accuracy and authenticity and power of what the author is recording. So the Scripture is, uh, in Luke's case, both the product of his human inquiry superimposed over the direct activity of the Holy Spirit, causing him to want to write, causing him to select the right things to report, and causing those things to be reported accurately, and also causing them to be written in such a way that they bring spiritual life to people. How many of you have ever read dull history? I mean, really history that absolutely rocked you to sleep. I would make a case that inspiration not only carries its scriptural definition of being outbreathed by God, but inspiration by its very necessity must also be inspiring. So that what is written here wakes us up, jabs us, gets us spiritually alive. And uh, part of the inspiration that Luke is writing with has that character to it. So he's picking up where he'd left off in Luke chapter 24 as he opens, and he said in that former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. So strike you, I hope it does, that phrase, all that Jesus began to do and teach. Luke summarizes his gospel, volume one, which begins earlier than the other gospels. Historically, it begins with the annunciation of the angel to uh, Mary and Genealogically, it goes all the way back to Adam, whereas Matthew only goes to Abraham. So Luke tried to, to push back our border of knowledge about Jesus to as, to as early as he could. And he takes us from that annunciation all the way through the ascension in Luke 24. And at the beginning of Acts, he summarizes all that epoch of time saying, this is all that Jesus began to do and teach. And the inference of that phrase, Jesus began to do and teach in relationship to the gospel, is a statement that Luke is making that Jesus is not through teaching or doing. That's the great thing he's saying to the church right off the bat. If you think Jesus is history, if you think Jesus is past tense, you've got another thing to, to consider because this same Jesus who is ascended now into heaven is continuing to do and to teach. And I immediately am drawn to that aspect. In fact, uh, it's the same kind of theme that Mark begins his gospel with, where he says in an unfinished sentence in verse 1 of chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, inferring that everything he writes is only the initiation, the beginning of what Jesus is doing. And whenever we breathe deeply in the New Testament spirit, we're breathing in the air of a risen, living Christ who is among his people, not a dead historical figure whose work is over, but a living spiritual reality whose work is just getting started. And I like that. I can't sit down. I get excited. I have to stand up. Until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, his passion, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Stop the reading there for a moment. Uh, Jesus' public ministry is sandwiched in between two epochs of 40 days. The first epoch of 40 days, he is totally alone and he is in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. The last 40 days after the resurrection, he is again alone, but with his disciples. He's not with the crowds. He's not appearing to unbelievers. He is ratifying his work to those who have trusted in him. And what do you think Jesus would have been doing in those 40 days? Uh, I would have liked to have known a lot of things in those 40 days had I had a chance to ask Jesus some questions. I would have liked to have known what the nature of the Trinity is like. I would like for that to be clearly explained to me, and if any of you clearly can explain it to everyone's satisfaction in the world, then you need to write a book. 
On that, I would like to know the relationship of predestination to free will. <clears throat> I would have asked Jesus that in those 40 days because I'm getting asked questions of that by my college age son and his roommate and that has engrossed them ever since their days at Newport Christian High School to the proper relationship betwe between those two things. I would have also liked some kind of description of angelic order and how heavenly rankings in the seraphs, cherubim, and angels, what it's like to be a common angel, where the order, uh, how it goes, and if you get a chance for a promotion, and those kinds of things. That would be, be interesting to know. I would like to know a little bit about what happens to the body uh, or what happens to the spirit when the body dies? I know we go to be with the Lord, yet we're putting the body in the ground. How can I have an existence and yet be waiting for my body to be resurrected? Now, I know that all that's going to be, but I'd like to understand. Would you like to understand that a little bit better? I'd like to understand that a little bit better. I would also uh, like the Lord to have maybe showed us some slides of what heaven is like. Give us a, a surely he had the capacity to make slides. I mean, you don't think the laws of photography were unknown to the Lord, do you? He, he, he's the creator of all things. He, he could have brought down uh, uh, maybe a few pictures he could have left behind. They could have financed his church for a long time, by the way. Jesus had all kinds of fundraising methods that he neglected to employ to make sure that his church stayed well and healthy. But I'd, I'd, like, to have, I'd like to have known that. I would, I would like to know a lot of, quote, esoteric secret hidden things now the reason I bring this up is there has always been in Christianity something called Gnosticism I referred to that a couple of weeks ago when I preached on Kingdom Now theology Gnosticism was a church heresy beginning in the end of the first century extending all the way through the early centuries that is based upon a Greek word gnosis knowledge Gnosticism and the Gnostics came along and said well here we have the external word and but if you come into our group, we're going to give you hidden interpretation of Scripture. We're going to take you into dreams and revelations, and you get in our group, and you're going to no longer have the milk for babes. You're going to get into the real meat, and you're going to understand orders and rankings and angels, and they had all kinds of marvelous mysteries they were expounding. There is always that subtle danger in the body of Christ that we might want to leave the plain things of Scripture and get into things that are not plain readings of Scripture and get into esoteric truth or Gnostic truth. We're trying to know and identify with and live in mysteries that plain aren't any of our business to know and they can't be known because they've never been objectively revealed in the Bible. It's interesting that Jesus in those 40 days did not take those 40 days as a platform for giving the disciples new teaching which they had not been given during the three years of his earthly ministry. What he's doing in those 40 days is restating the basic premise of his early ministry, his three-year ministry, and that basic premise was to do with the kingdom of God. If you look and what Jesus is teaching in the Gospels, always the focus of what he is saying is on the kingdom of God. The parables deal in massive quantities, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, with the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, basically defined by Jesus, is both now and it is then. It is now in the heart. It is not seen. It is not political. It is not external. It must be received. It grows secretly as seed in the soil, and it has differing levels of growth and responsiveness. But the kingdom then, when the Lord returns, will be one which will be political, external, and for all. But right now, the kingdom is within you. And he was reinforcing that message of the kingdom in those days and illustrating why, as the king, he needed to lay down his life in Jerusalem and die for his people. So he reinforces and reinterprets what he has done in those three years of his ministry, speaking about the kingdom of God. And in addition to a doctrinal theme, the kingdom of God, Jesus is also talking about a person. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus here was saying to disciples, in addition to, in addition to knowing what I've taught you, I'm going to give you a gift. And the gift is also referred to here as a baptism. A baptism or an immersion with the Holy Spirit. Now, here immediately we get into a doctrinal question. Were the disciples at this point saved? 
had they made had they made a statement of saving faith in Jesus and if they were saved did they then not already have the Holy Spirit and the answer to those questions is yes the gospel witness makes it clear that they had passed from death unto life that beginning with the confession at Caesarea Philippi when Peter said you are the Messiah the son of the living God that is the basis upon which the Christian faith rests and that following the resurrection of Jesus Christ in John chapter 20 verse 22 Jesus breathed into them and said receive the Spirit and in that act of breathing Jesus recreated the drama of the Garden of Eden when he took the lifeless form of mortal man and breathed into him air, pneuma, life. Jesus now after the resurrection says, I am the new Adam, the second Adam, and I have a new order life, not just biological life like I gave to Adam, but I now have resurrection life to breathe into you. So he breathed into them and they received the spirit, the air, the wind, the reviving power of God in the personality of the Spirit. And uh, we draw the conclusion from this that anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his power and in his resurrection from the dead is a receiver of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit indwells every born-again Christian. And I say this as a Pentecostal preacher who teaches that there is a subsequent experience in the Holy Spirit beyond conversion, a baptism in the Spirit beyond conversion. Jesus here in, John, in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 is not talking about the conversion experience. They've already had that in John chapter 20 when he's breathed upon them and ratified to them the benefits of resurrection life. But he's saying now, you who are my disciples who believed on me, there is yet a subsequent experience where you are going to get saturated with the Spirit. And uh, we'll look at this more as we come to those passages in the book of Acts. But Jesus was very concerned that his disciples not go out and try to do things in their own power. You see, if a group of us had been present on that particular occasion when Jesus ascended into heaven, we might uh, legitimately say, well, now that he's gone, let's see, what are we going to do? We need to have a planning committee. And I would suggest we develop a statement of mission, and then we develop a statement of objectives, and then we develop our strategies, and then we prioritize the strategies and add infinitum, and that we go at this from a method system. And we do good process management, and we get to a conclusion, we've got to go to all the world, so guys, we've got to figure this out. And, there, and I'm not against, by the way, appropriate planning and the like, but, uh, but I, am a, I am deeply committed to the fact that the Holy Spirit is at work in the world to do a lot of leapfrogging. And that there are times where I'm connecting point A, point B, C, and D in my logical, methodical manner, and it's the Holy Spirit's intention to absolutely leapfrog over B, C, D, and F and get all the way from A to G in one fell swoop, that he's going for it. And there are times we simply have to realize that the Holy Spirit is what he, it says he is. He is air or wind, and he can come in with a great gust and suddenly lift us further than we ever dreamed. We must always, not always think of spiritual growth as something which is like biological growth, steady and progressive. Spiritual growth is that. We add line to line, precept to precept. But there are also occasions when seemingly spiritually we just go, we're at here, and all of a sudden we have a powerful encounter with God, and bang, we're all the way over here. 30 minutes maybe have gone by, but we've had a tremendous transformation. And Jesus says to his church, look, you need this Holy Spirit because the mission I'm giving to you is too big for you to do with your own thinking, no matter how bright you are. You've got to rely on a power that is stronger than your own. The church has to rely upon the work of God or upon the person of God to do the work of God. If it doesn't, it's dead in the water. So you'll receive the Holy Spirit, a promise not just made to them, but I believe a promise, as we'll see when we go through Acts, made to all of us. Don't leave Jerusalem. Don't get busy doing things until you've got this power and this baptism. So everything's wrapped up. 40 days go by, he's done. He's talked to them about his program, the kingdom of God, and about the person, the Holy Spirit. And they've just got one loose end when it's all done. And the loose end is this. Jesus, where is the kingdom? They're still hung up on this. We believe you're the king, the Messiah, but okay, it's gonna now be in our hearts, but when are you gonna give this kingdom to Israel? They lived in a culture which had differing perspectives of when the kingdom was going to come. It's very interesting that, that the culture of their day was exactly like the culture of our days. If you look at camps in Christianity today, there's no difference in those camps 
and the camps in Judaism at this time of the writing of the book of Acts. There were, there were those who were called the Essenes. And they, in relationship to the kingdom of God, said, the world is so messed up, we can't do anything about it. We're not even going to try. We're going to go out into the desert, found our own community, get our own act together, get holy and get cleaned up. And if we get holy enough and purified enough, someday the teacher of righteousness may come. And if he comes, he'll come to us. And to you know where with the rest of the world. And that group is represented in the church today by those who quote the verse, come out from among them and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. They're, they're in a sense saying, we want to live in our own closed quarters. Don't make us have contact with anybody. We're the holy club. When Jesus comes back to earth, he's going to come to our church and to our pastor and to our denomination, us three and no more. Praise God, we're going through all the despised few we're going through. The kingdom of God is he's washed up with the world. It's all headed for the, the wastebasket, but we're the righteous ones, the Essenes. The kingdom isn't coming to those people out there, it's waiting for us. Then there were the zealots who said, hey, none of this stuff with waiting. God's wait God's God himself delays the kingdom to see if we're serious about it. So let's get involved. We got to show good faith to the Lord. So let's get involved in politics and let's show the Messiah that we mean business. Let's kick out Rome. Let's take over the government. Let's dominionize society. Let's have the kingdom here and now, and to do this, if we need to, let's use force. They were called the zealots, and they said the kingdom can't come until the Lord sees we're serious about bringing the kingdom, and then when we get everything ready for him, we can roll out the red carpet and say, even so come, Messiah. And then there were the Sadducees, the, what we would call the liberal wing of the church who said, all this stuff about a kingdom, it ain't never going to come, folks. This is the best of all possible worlds. And everybody's got to have a religious system because people need religion. So since they need religion, let's provide the institutions. Let's make a good living off religion, but let's not take things too seriously. Let's forget this stuff about miracles and angels and revealed truth and stuff like this. And let's just say whatever goes, goes. And let's keep the system going and keep the pious few gullible and help use the revenues to found the great enterprises we're involved in. And then there were the Pharisees who Jesus most identified with, by the way, who said, what we must do is do the best we can in the midst of this wicked and perverse generation. Let's live not separated from society, but let's maintain an inner code that is different. And they extended that to also maintain an outer code of dress that separated them. But they were all, in one way or another, looking for the kingdom. And so the disciples coming out of that matrix were saying, Lord, what about the kingdom? When is your kingdom going to come? Are you going to restore it now to Israel? And Jesus didn't say to them, don't you know yet that the millennium is never going to happen, that all those promises with Israel are all, all over. They're all in the past, and I've abrogated them, and there's a whole new covenant in effect, and Jerusalem will never become the world capital, and the temple will never be rebuilt, and the Antichrist is never going to come, and the Messiah will never sit on the throne of Jerusalem, and, and all that stuff is relegated to the past. Don't you know that yet? I'm going to stay with you 40 more days and get you guys' theology straightened out. He doesn't answer them that way. He just says to them, it's not for you to know the chronos or the kairos, the times or the seasons. Those are two Greek words, synonyms. Chronos is the word from which we get chronology. It's some of what you are doing when you look at your watch. You're watching chronology, time go by. It's not for you to know the length of time, chronology, or the kairos, the season time, the appropriate time, the right time, the quality of time. It's not to you to know quantity of time or quality of time, but it's instead for you to do something else. It's time for you to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power. Power. I hear, I hear at various times preachers point out, and this is true, that the basic word underlying power here is the word dunamis, from which we derive the word dynamite. You receive power. Well, the only problem with dynamite is it blows people up. And I'm not sure that what Jesus is promising here is a TNT experience. What he is promising is that he is going to do in regard to our potential two things. All of us have potential which we have not tapped. It's just native potential, native ability. And power involves the capacity to reach your potential. That's one dimension to it. And the second dimension is this, that there is potential in you that you don't see, that only God himself sees. And the power of the Holy Spirit is to cause you to walk in that second level of potential that is even beyond the potential you have as a native human being.
I think that's fabulous. Because you look at your life, why am I shouting? I'm all, I should be sitting down. I well, start out to sit down. I can't believe it. I believe this stuff, you know. <clears throat> I'm not all, I'm not, God's not all done making me yet. And there are times when I, when I get so frustrated with what I'm doing and my lack of ability and my inadequacy that I need a good shot in the arm like this that says God has not given up on producing potential in my life that is there both in the natural man and is there in the spiritual man that is beyond the capacity that I can see personally. And he wants to give us that dunamis of the Holy Spirit so that we might be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You look at the task of the early church. Wow. I've made this comparison before, but if you took the then known number of people in the world, you would get the magnitude of the tasks that they face. There were approximately 4 million people in Palestine at the time. Jerusalem, Judea, 4 million. About the amount of people that are in Israel today. 120 people for the 4 million, or one believer for every 33,000 people. Since there are 110,000 people roughly in Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, that would amount to about four believers to reach those two towns. And there were approximately 250 million people in the then Roman world, which means there was one believer for every 1.2 million people. And I'll tell you, if I were looking at those odds as a statistician, I would say, wow. One of the evidences for Christianity is that the church is here after 20 centuries and that the church of Jesus Christ penetrated the world and that it grew for more than a small little group of 120, but it had powerful effect. In fact, within 30 years, it was so powerful that it could not be numbered. After a while, even the book of Acts, they give up counting. And in fact, after the day of Pentecost, the church could never again fit in a single room. Do you know that we will never again be in a single room until we're in that great banquet hall in the kingdom to come? And then at one time, the church from all centuries and ethnic groups and backgrounds is going to gather and all at one time ring in the married supper of the Lamb. That's the next time we'll all be in one room. Acts 1 and 2 was the last time the church was in a single room. It's going to explode beyond that. It's going to have a ministry. And let no one look and, uh, at the size of a challenge and say it can't be done. One of, the, one of the real tendencies that we have as Christians, and I think this is especially true in Orange County, we're all seeking for close personal relationships because we live in such an uh, impersonal world and we're separated from our extended families, many of us. And so we're, we often say of the church, well, I sure hope the church doesn't grow much because I don't like big churches. And I, I know what people mean when they say that. It's, it's a pain to have to, to, to be lost in a crowd and not know anybody. But yet, if the church is going to be true to its mission of extending the gospel to every single human being, growth is part and parcel of what God has to do. And it means we have got ourselves to get into a growth modality, a growth pattern, a growth mentality, where instead of wanting things to stay small so we can be comfortable, we want the kingdom to expand so we can have more responsibility. Do you want to be more comfortable or do you want more responsibility? That will, to a great degree, determine how mature you are as a believer. Immature believers want to be comfortable, don't want to have to do anything. In a comfortable church, you know everybody's name. In a growing church, you'll never know anyone's name if there's too much going on. In a comfortable church, everybody has a job and there are plenty of people that don't have to do anything. In a church that's growing, there's always going to be a need for more and more workers to be involved because we're in a responsibility mode of our spiritual life and behavior. Am I reading too much into Acts? I don't think I'm reading too much into it. You'll be my witnesses. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. That was better than any blast off at Cape Canaveral. <laughs> I'd like to have seen that. No, here, here, is a, here is something that absolutely defies all the laws of physics. <clears throat> Without engines, the Lord blasts off. And you have to ask the question, where did he go? 
How did he dis how did he survive in the ionosphere when he got when he got when he got up to 30,000 feet? What was going on? And did he have to fly through the planets? And how far did he go? Is is the dwelling place of God somewhere out there in the universe? The the edge of the universe is supposed to be 10 billion light years out there, which means if you travel 186,282 miles per second for what 10 billion years, you're going to get there. But even when you get there, there may be more out there. And you still haven't stepped outside time and space. So when it says Jesus ascended into heaven, heaven must not simply be the blue sky. Heaven must be outside of the created order, and it doesn't take 10 billion light years to get there, just like it doesn't take 10 billion light years for our prayers to reach God. But stepping outside of time and space in a dimension no telescope has yet probed, Jesus goes from earth to heaven like that. It's, I tell you, if, if you're not into the miraculous, Christianity is not for you. All right. There's just too much happening here. And um, one of the things we know about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the change that was produced in disciples' lives is that they were eyewitnesses of all this. They were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. They were eyewitnesses to the living Christ who presented himself by infallible proofs. And they were eyewitnesses to his ascension. A common person without that experience would not have believed any of that stuff. But they were credible people who saw it and bore witness to it. One other note about the ascension that uh, I would like to point out, and it's from observation of having been in the Holy Land a number of times. The Mount of Olives is one of my very favorite places. It was obviously one of Jesus' favorite places. He loved to pray at the base of the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. He taught on the Mount of Olives. One of his great discourses, the Olivet Discourse, was on the Mount of Olives directly uh, facing the Temple Mount. He walked over the Mount of Olives to Bethany day in and day out in the last week, and he ascended from the Mount of Olives. Even in Jesus' day, the Mount of Olives like it is today is a burial ground. And, and if you want to, in Judaism, be buried in the spot. I mean, please don't bury me at, at Pacific Cemetery or what is it called? Oh, that's my favorite place in Southern California over at Newport Beach. It has a water view, and I've always wanted to have a water view. So I figured that's about as close as I'm going to get. You know, I just like, really like Pacific Cemetery. <clears throat> but my first choice is give me the Mount of Olives. I'm going to be buried. I don't know how you can get me in there because the Muslims are on one side and the Jewish people are on another side. I don't think there's a Christian cemetery there. But there are graves on the Mount of Olives that go back for millenniums, not just centuries, millenniums. And on that spot, the Mount of Olives, which is littered with burial stones. The whole mountainside is burial stones. In that place of death, Jesus becomes the one human being that instead of going down into the Mount of Olives, goes up from the Mount of Olives. And the point was not lost on the contemporaries of Jesus' day that here's a person who didn't go into the ground, but he went up to the ground and he he took the symbolic spot in all of Judaism where burial took place to make it a place of triumph and ascension. I was a master stroke of planning. Whoever says the Lord doesn't plan things out, I, he's a strategist. He's going, to take, he's going to take the symbols of death and turn them into symbols of life. And Zechariah says he's going to come back on the Mount of Olives. And I'll tell you, there's going to be some... I'd like to see... Uh, well, except I'm going to be in heaven. I won't need to watch TV then, but uh, I'd like to see the news reports of all the open graves on the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> they looked intently up to the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Notice they didn't have wings or anything like that. Just wearing white clothes. And said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Now, there are some saying in our day, like there were Gnostics in Jesus' day that, or after Jesus' day, in the Apostles' day, that Jesus is not going to have a literal return to earth, that he is, his coming is going to be a coming in the transported lives of his children. It'll be a hidden coming. Well, here's the rebuttal to that point of view, to say that the coming of Jesus will be as visible and as evidently physical as his ascension into heaven. Jesus enters into heaven, and the church then does some things that we read about in verses 12 through verse 26 that give us the character of the early church. And I want to spend just a few moments here talking about this pre-Pentecostal powerful church that when a church begins to move in these qualities, there are four qualities that are noted here from verse 12 through 26, or when an individual Christian begins to move in these qualities, they open themselves up to a tremendous work of the Holy Spirit. 
The first quality is obedience. That is always the mark of mature discipleship and of a vital church. The th what the disciples dis did after Jesus ascended is instead of immediately dispersing and beginning to carry the good news, they remembered that Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem and wait. So even though they didn't understand it, and even though they had to be busting with joy to be able to tell that story to other people, they obeyed and went back. And the second thing that they did is they were meeting together in unity. There was the 12 who are named, and they were joined constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary. This is not just a male group now. And by the way, the last mention we have of Mary in the Bible, she was in a prayer meeting, and she wasn't leading the prayer meeting either, and she wasn't being prayed to. That should be noted. She was part of the prayer meeting. And Jesus' brothers, who were previously in the Gospels mentioned as being alienated from him and not believing in him, they're there. And in fact, the number altogether is 120. And Acts 2.1 tells us they were all together in one place, meaning there was a tremendous unity. They, had been, they were stayed in that place together for 10 days. And I would like to put before you the idea that unity takes time. And one of the problems we have in the contemporary church is we don't have time. I find in the church that people only take time, that about 70 to 80% of the church of Jesus Christ today takes time to be together with the body one hour a week in a structured worship setting, and that is it. I am going to make a flat-out statement. As long as the church continues in that pattern, it will never, ever have revival. It is absolutely impossible to have revival and only give one hour a week to being together with God's people. It'll never happen. It'll not happen in a million centuries. It takes a significant amount of being together, and not just being together socially, but being together spiritually, praying together, singing together, hearing God's word together, testifying together, praying together. It takes that being together to provide a matrix of warmth and relationship which becomes a fertile soil in which to place a new believer, a converted believer. Instead of putting a new believer into a community of strangers, the church has to be a living web of deep interpersonal human relationships that have been graced by the Spirit of God. And I, I, I will share with you as a pastor, I do not know how to, how to change the trend the church is in. We are in a humongously busy culture. Everybody is going every single direction they can go. And we've got mobility. We've got financial mobility. We've got homes on wheels. We've got income that often allows people to, to be able to take time to pursue personal pursuits. And there's nothing wrong with any of these things of or by themselves except that ultimately they produce a devastating effect on the church because people do not have time to be the church. If I understand anything about the church, how would you like to, what if, would happen if as a pastor I declared that from, I ask everybody in the congregation next year from July the 1st to July 10th to plan taking their 10, 10 vacation days and not doing anything off on your own but spending them, we're all going to get a place and we're all going to go off together and we're going to spend 10 days singing, praying, eating, fellowshipping, and waiting upon God and hearing God's word. We're going to take 10 solid days as a church, and once you come, you can't phone out, you can't leave, you have to be there, and the whole church has to go. Not a single person can be left out. If we did that for 10 days, hey, you could write the history of this church in block letters a mile high because it would absolutely explode. You can't have that kind of a group experience in the presence of the Holy Spirit and not have something significantly happen to alter forever people's relationships to God and to one another. As long as the church is fooling around with one structured hour a week, it, is, it may gain a little bit of ground, but it's not going to dynamically penetrate society. I wish that weren't true, but I'm afraid that's true. And I, I tell you, I'm frustrated as a pastor with the state of the church in that area of togetherness, I don't know how to bring, uh, yeah, I'm just praying about it, but unity is essential and it takes time. These guys, they weren't, they weren't independently rich. If I understand Peter and the boys, they were middle-class fishermen. They belonged to the Qantas Club back at Capernaum and they were missing two meetings by being down in Jerusalem. They didn't have people just independently supporting them, but these people took the time to be together. They were at the beginning of a, 
whole new thing, splendid thing God was doing in the earth, and it took time. And they forged a unity. The Holy Spirit forged a unity among them. And that's critical. And then uh, another thing which they did that's so important is they got into the Word. They, uh, they obeyed the Lord. They had unity, and they got into the Word. And we know they got into the Word because of what they did. Peter, and as this meeting is progressing, has been troubled because he's been reading Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. And Psalm 100 and, and, and those two Psalms, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109, Peter, as he's reading them, understands that they are Psalms which talk about the enemy of the Lord. The innocent one described in those two Psalms has an enemy. And Jesus is the innocent one, and he had an enemy, Judas. And those two psalms eloquently speak of the fate of Judas. And they contain phrases, those psalms do, like, may his place be deserted and let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. And Peter's reading along in those psalms, and he says, Something, somebody's got to be appointed to his position. There's a scripture that says, let another take his place. So they select a person to replace the fallen Judas. I want to, I don't want to get into the whole thing of the mystery of Judas. I simply want to note that it was as a result of studying the scripture that the early church made a decision to replace him. And there are some who said the early church right at the beginning before Pentecost made a mistake. They didn't have the Holy Spirit yet and they do something premature. God had saved that 12th place for the apostle Paul. And the early church got presumptuous and jumped in there. I say humbug on that view because here is the church's very first decision after the Lord ascended into heaven and they were going straight to the scripture for guidance. And if you can't get guidance from scripture, then what can you trust? And I just refuse to believe and can't see it even as logical to believe that in the very first decision the church reaches after the ascension of Christ, they're already blundering into mistakes. I just can't buy that. They read the scripture, they were absorbed with the scripture, and they were, they were wanting to be guided by it, which is in real contradistinction to people today who would have said, no, nah, let's not go to scripture, let's pray and get a revelation. Who's the revelation? Who's got the gift of prophecy as to who's supposed to replace Judas? No, it wasn't that at all. It was let's get into the word and see if it has any direction. And then they put forward a very common thing. They said, well, there got to be some qualifications for a replacement. He had to be with Jesus from the baptism of John until now. That was their qualification to be an apostle. So there were only two that fit the bill. And the two to fit the bill were... Uh, Joseph called Barthabbas and Matthias. So what did they do? They prayed, and then they cast lots or drew straws, and the lot fell, or the straw fell to Matthias. See, is that spiritual? Wow, 12th apostle is selected by flipping a coin. That's what it was. It was flipping a coin. Again, they were being scriptural. Proverbs 16:33: the lot is cast into the lap, but the decision is holy from the Lord. The decision is holy from the Lord. You flip the coin, but God determines what sides it's going to land on. What had they done? They had said, we used all of the intelligence we knew how to make a proper criteria for leadership. We were done making that criteria. We had two choices. In the natural, we didn't know which choice to make, so we simply left the decision to God. And since Proverbs 16, 33 gives us permission to cast lots, we cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. Can you do that with getting God's will in your life? Can you flip a coin? You're going with two gals right now and you're not sure which one's the right one. Flip a coin. It might work. We'll talk later as we go through Acts about how to make decisions in the will of God, but that's certainly an intriguing one. They were trying to be true to Scripture. One parenthetical thing, and it doesn't relate to any of the three points that I developed, but just a real sidelight that to me is kind of interesting is that uh, in verse 13, the last of the 11 apostles that is named is named Judas, son of James. And in Luke 6, which contains another listing of the apostles, Luke also lists him as Judas, son of James. But Matthew and Mark, in listing the apostles, never refer to this man, Judas, son of James. He's known by another name, Thaddeus. Since Luke is always the historian of accuracy, he, al he always goes back for the precise thing and you'll see this as we go through Luke he's and 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 also acts he's always more precise what evidently happened in the early church is as time went along this Judas number two called Judas son of James not Judas Iscariot got tired of people saying to him boy you sure have a lousy name or are, are you were you related to Judas Iscariot 
So he said, I'm tired of that name. From now on, just call me Thaddeus. And so he, 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 got a, he got a different name. That's why the listing of names is different. You'll notice also that in Matthew's gospel, it, noticed that Judas, it notes that Judas went out and hanged himself. Whoever Luke tells us that Judas bought a field where he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Now those two accounts, Matthew and, and Acts, are not contradictory, for indeed in the course of the hanging, there could have been the kind of fall that is described in Luke with his intestines breaking and spilling out. By the way, the field of Akaldama, the field of blood in Jerusalem, is at the western end of the Valley of Hinnom, the Valley of Hell. And that is suggestive of the fact that when we get out of God's will, we wind up in hell, the trash dump of Jerusalem. The early church was committed to obedience. It was definitely committed to unity. It was committed to the word. And then the fourth quality of a growing dynamic Christian and of a growing dynamic church is that it was committed to prayer. They prayed constantly, verse 14. They all joined constantly in prayer. Verse I just saw it here. Verse 24, then they prayed. And there was a specific prayer. I mentioned this about a year and a half ago when we began our quarterly prayer meetings at the church that I had had a conversation with Armin Gesswein, who's been a spiritual confidant of Billy Graham and a great help in building the prayer ministry around Billy Graham. Armin Gesswein said, if you go into an average church and look at their literature and their program, you'll find that the church almost never gathers together for prayer. It has everything else on the agenda but prayer. And he said, God has called me to a ministry to make the main things out of the plain things in Scripture, and prayer is the main thing, and it's the plain thing. And the Christian life and the church cannot be built simply by the implementation of good programs, no matter how well conceived and executed those programs they are. And indeed, some of the programs probably ought to be executed. <clears throat> it's prayer that is the life of the church. Depending in submission upon the Lord for his will and his leadership, being open for a fresh sweep of the Spirit. The church, at the close of Acts chapter 1, has no idea of the explosion that is in store for it. It is on the edge of a great miracle and doesn't even know it at that moment. And I would suggest to you that any time in your life or any time the church corporately does the same kind of things, that are done in chapter 1, that church or that person is again on the edge of a tremendous explosion and powerful moving of the Lord. But somewhere along the line, there has got to be an unreserved commitment to obey the Lord. There has to be a willingness to commit the time to be together in unity, not just union, but unity. Union is when you tie two cat's tails together. You have union, but you don't have unity. And the church of Jesus Christ is often like that. We've got people all together in union, and we're, our names are on the membership roll or on the contribution record, but there are differences and sharp feelings and animosities and hidden agendas and turfs to protect and all those kinds of things which speak of union but not unity, somehow the church has got to go past that, do double and triple dosages of forgiveness and reconciliation and say, in Christ we will be united, we will ask the Spirit to unite us, take the time to be united, move past unity into a real absorption with God's Word and bake that all in prayer, and there's no telling what God will do when that combination is fulfilled. Our Father... We pray for the church today, for this church, and for our lives personally. As we watch the events of the book of Acts, our hearts open wide with anticipation. And we want to present ourselves to you, Lord Jesus, and say, here we are, Lord. Do it again. May the story of Pentecost and the expansion of the church not be something we simply read about in the Bible or in history books. May our own eyes see and our own lips proclaim the glory of God to our generation. Visit your church again with a new Pentecost. Visit us again with your Holy Spirit in power and in might. 
we offer ourselves to you that your will might be done on earth through us. In Jesus' name.